So for me, I've been trying to figure out, I've been wrestling with this new year is coming. <clears throat> what, do, what do we preach on? What, what, what do we need to hear? And uh, times aren't easy for many of us. And uh, I'll be honest, it's going to be difficult probably for a while. And there's probably going to be new challenges next year that will come. So what we need is to be encouraged and we need to be strengthened. So the question I was chewing on for the last couple of weeks was this, how do I best encourage us? So after consideration and after prayer, I settled on the fact that what we need is to be reminded of who Jesus is. There's a hymn that's familiar to many of us that speaks about this, and the hymn goes this way. O soul, are you weary and troubled? No light in the darkness you see. There's light for a look at the Savior and life more abundant and free. Turn your eyes upon Jesus. Look full in his wonderful face. And the things of earth will grow strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace. That song was, was uh, sung during this Christmas Eve by Serena. And uh, that was such a beautiful reminder that what we need is to turn our attention to Jesus. So over the next eight weeks, what we're going to do is we're going to look at the I am statements of Jesus and John. But we're actually going to begin in the book of Exodus before we jump into uh, the book of John. And uh, so if you have your Bibles, go with me to Exodus chapter 3. So there we read. Now Moses was keeping the flock of his father-in-law, Jethro, the priest of Midian, and he led his flock to the west side of the wilderness and came to Horeb, the mountain of God. And the angel of the Lord appeared to him in a flame of fire out of the midst of a bush. He looked, and behold, the bush was burning, yet it was not consumed. And Moses said, I will turn aside to see this great sight, why the bush is not burned. When the Lord saw that he had turned aside to, to see, God called to him out of the bush, Moses, Moses. And he said, here I am. Then he said, do not come near. Take your sandals off your feet. For the place on which you are standing is holy ground. And he said, I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob. And Moses hid his face, for he was afraid to look at God. And the Lord said, I have surely seen the affliction of my people who are in Egypt, and I've heard their cry because of their taskmasters. I know their sufferings, and I've come down to deliver them out of the hand of the Egyptians and to bring them up out of that land to a good and broad land, a land flowing with milk and honey to the place of the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Amorites, the Perizzites, the Hivites, and the Jebusites. And now behold, the cry of the people of Israel has come to me, and I have also seen the oppression with which the Egyptians oppressed them. Come, I will send you to Pharaoh that you may bring my people, the children of Israel, out of Egypt. But Moses said to God, Who am I that I should go to Pharaoh and bring the children of Israel out of Egypt? He said, But I will be with you, and this shall be the sign for you that I have sent you. When you have brought the people out of Egypt, you shall serve God on this mountain. Then Moses said to God, If I come to the people of Israel and say to them, The God of your fathers has sent me to you, and they ask, what is his name? What shall I say to them? 
God said to Moses, I am who I am. And he said, say this to the people of Israel. I am has sent me to you. God also said to Moses, say this to the people of Israel. The Lord, the God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob has sent me to you. This is my name forever. And thus I am to be remembered throughout all generations. Let's bow our heads for a moment of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for the source of encouragement it is. We thank you that you are the great I am. Father God, as we spend time looking at this passage, I pray that we are encouraged as we turn our attention on who you are and not who we are. And let us be reminded that you are with us this year, this week, today, right now. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. So, <clears throat> what is happening in this passage? Well, what you have in the first six verses is you have God grabbing the attention of Moses. Moses, if you remember, had run away from Egypt. He had beaten an Egyptian for, well, sorry, he had killed an Egyptian for beating a slave. That was 40 years earlier. So at that moment, he ran. And he settled down in Midian. He got married to one of Jethro's daughters. He started a new life. He, he became a shepherd to uh, Jethro's sheep. One day he is leading the sheep and he notices something. Something catches his eye. There's a bush that is burning on a mountain, but it's not being consumed. This doesn't happen every day. So what happens? Well, he turns his attention towards this bush and out comes a voice, God's voice, Moses, Moses. And then he is introduced to God. In the next few verses, God informs Moses of his situation in Egypt. He, sa he says he's seen and he's heard the cries of his people under the suffering, under Pharaoh and the taskmasters. And he is about to do something. Well, in verse 10, God tells Moses what he's going to do, what he has determined. He says in verse 10, Come, I will send you to Pharaoh that you may bring my people, the children of Israel, out of Egypt. So what is God going to do? God is going to send Moses back to where he came from, back to where he ran from. His task was going to be to go, to be God's spokesperson, to go on his behalf in front of Pharaoh to demand that Pharaoh let, his, uh, let the, uh, the Israelites go. Would have this been an easy mission? No. The Israelites are a broken people. They are a greatly discouraged people. They have been slaves for hundreds of years. Pharaoh is a powerful king. But not only is he a powerful king, he's got a powerful army behind him. And not only that, but the Egyptians have a plethora of gods, false gods, who we would think is nothing because there is only one true God, but that still is pretty intimidating. A plethora of, of these, these, these gods. Moses grew up in Egypt. He knows all this. He knows where he is being sent to. And he asked the question in verse 11, a question we ask a lot. He asked this, who am I? Who am I that I should go to Pharaoh and bring the children of Israel out of Egypt? Moses is feeling inadequate. 
who am I? I'm just a shepherd keeping my father-in-law's sheep. Not a king. Who am I? I'm just one person. Pharaoh is a man with an army behind him. Who am I? To add to that, Moses had attempted to lift the burdens of one person, and he ended up striking a person dead and having to run. Who am I? Who am I? I, I think we can relate to Moses here. Who am I? That, that's a question we ask. It's a question we ask when we are called to do something. Who am I? We often feel our own inadequacy. We often feel and believe that we are not up to the task. That we don't have the skills. That we don't have the abilities that are needed. And that's because we are often called to do things that are beyond ourselves. Beyond our own capability and the reason for that is so that God may be glorified who am I I'm just one person who am I now notice how God responds it's very interesting the way he responds <clears throat> he doesn't spend time reminding Moses who he is he doesn't remind Moses of the 40 years that he spent in Egypt as an adopted son of Pharaoh's daughter. Could you imagine what that all came with? He would have had proficiency of the Egyptian language. He would have had knowledge of Egyptian customs. He would have had probably top-notch schooling. God doesn't say to Moses, Moses, I have been preparing you for this task. All the experience I have led you through has made you the man for this task. He doesn't remind Moses who he is. Pretty interesting, isn't it? Because that would be what we would want to do. We would want to come and say, you know what? You, you've got this, this skill. You, you've got this ability. You, you, you can do this. But... That's not it. How does God respond to Moses? It says in verse 11, uh, verse 12, it says, but I will be with you. I will be with you, Moses. That's a phrase we often hear throughout the Old Testament. Fear not, for I am with you. Be not dismayed, for I am your God. I will strengthen you. I will help you. I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. That's the memory verse that we had this week. I'm with you. That's a promise of, of his presence, of his presence being with us. God is promising that he would be with Moses. You, you see, it doesn't matter who we are. What truly matters is who God is. And that he is with us. So the question we need to ask is this. Who is God? Who is God? And Moses will ask a very similar question to this. In verse 13, he's going to ask for his name. Verse 13 says, Then Moses said to God, If I come to the people of Israel and say to them, The God of your fathers has sent me to you, and they ask me, What is his name? What shall I say to them? In ancient times, a person's name often reflected who they are, their character. So Moses isn't simply asking God, what's your name? He's asking a more 
better question. He's asking God, who are you? Who are you? And God responds this way. I am who I am. Tell the people I am has sent. You know, that kind of makes your head spin, doesn't it? What does that mean? I am who I am. And you know what? I spent a lot of time trying to, to, to figure that out, and my head is still spinning. Different people that I, I have listened to, different people that I have read, there is some variation on, on what this name means. But here are three things that, that they basically agree on, and that is, number one, He's in a category all of his own. He can only compare himself with himself because there is no one else like him. He's in a category all of his own. That's pretty neat. Number two, he is self-existent. The word here means to be. So he is a personification of to be. He is being itself. He has no beginning. He has no end because he is. He's always been. Everything except God has come into being. Except God. Because he always has been. And because everything else has come into being, that means everything depends upon God. Paul would say this on Mars Hill uh, in Athens. He would say to the philosophers in Acts 17, verse 28, In him, God, in him we live and move and have our being. Without him, there is nothing but God. The third thing, he is self-sufficient. Because he is not dependent on anything or anyone for his existence, he is the only one who is utterly free to do as he determines. The psalmist, one of the psalmists in the book of Psalms would say this, Our God is in the heavens. He does all that he pleases. He doesn't have to check to see if he has the ability. He doesn't have to check to see if, if somebody else will overcome what he's done. He does all that he pleases. He's not dependent upon anyone. That's really reassuring because in our story that is before us, what is it that God has determined to do? He's determined to rescue his people. And he's determined to use Moses as the instrument to bring about this deliverance. And God has at his disposal everything that he needs in order to bring this about. And, and as I reflect on that, there's a verse that comes to my mind, Romans 8, 31. If God is for us, who can be against us? Moses asked the question, who am I? And God basically responds this way, Moses, it doesn't matter who you are. It matters who I am. And I will be with you. The answer to our inadequacy is not trying better. The answer to our inadequacy is not trying to get different abilities to, to make us do better. The answer to our inadequacy is God. Is God. What is it that Moses needed? Courage? 
strength. That's true. What he really needed was God. <laughs> he needed God. And especially when you look at verse 22 and 23. There we, we see there these words. Uh, I think I got the wrong ones here. Let me just read what I have on, on my paper here. It's, but I know that the king of Egypt will not let you go unless compelled by a mighty hand. So I will stretch out my hand and strike Egypt with all the wonders that I will do in it. After that, he will let you go. The only way Pharaoh was going to let his people, uh, let the Israelites go, was by seeing the mighty hand of God. God will be the one to change Pharaoh's heart, to bend his will, to enable him to say they can go. So what Moses needed wasn't so much courage. He, he didn't so much need boldness or, or strength. What he needed was God. He needed God. That's what we need too. Who we need is God. Now, it's not just that God is is big enough. It's not that just God is powerful enough to do what he determines. He actually cares. He cares and he enters into life and relates with his people. I want to bring your attention to a few action words here. In verse 7, we see the word seen. It says, then the Lord said, I have surely seen the affliction of my people who are in Egypt. God saw. God saw their suffering. God saw their hurt. God saw what they were going through. Friends, God sees. He sees us. He sees what we are going through. Second action word is heard. It says, and have heard the cry because of their taskmasters. He not only saw, but he heard. He heard their prayers. He heard their pleas for help. Friends, God hears. God hears us. When we pray, when we talk to him, he hears us. When we are struggling and and when we are hurting and all that can come out are tears he hears us the third word is not so much maybe an action word but it's an important word it says i know their sufferings he knows he knew their sufferings he knew exactly what they were going through He knows what we are going through. He knows. But it's not just that he saw and he heard and he knows. I mean, that's great in itself. It's amazing in itself. Just for, for the God of the universe to hear us, for the God of the universe to see us, for the, for the God of the universe to know us, that in itself is amazing. But that's not where it stops. Here's the other action word. Comes down. And I have come down to deliver them out of the hand of the Egyptians and to bring them up out of that land to a good and broad land, a land flowing with milk and honey. He comes down. He enters in. He acts. And in this case, he delivers. He delivers his people. God engages with us. 
That is what is amazing. And he is the one who engages in order to deliver and to lead us and to bring us through and, and to bring us into a good land. Maybe you're wondering, does he care about me? Does he know what I'm going through? The struggles that happened this year, does, is, he, is he even paying attention? The answer is yes, he is. He sees, he's heard, he knows, and he will act. May also be thinking, why start here? I thought we were supposed to be doing a, a sermon series on the I am statements of Jesus. So why start here? I'll give you two reasons. First, because Jesus is the greatest example of God coming down to rescue his people and to bring them into a place that is good. What Jesus did, he came down from heaven. He was born as a child for us. So that he may live the life we could not live, so that he could rescue us, so that there can be forgiveness. Here's the second reason why I believe we need to start here, and that is because Jesus himself claims this title for himself. If you go in your Bible to John 8, John 8, verse 58, it's what we read. Then Jesus said to them, truly, truly, I say to you, before Abraham was, I am. You know, the people there knew exactly what he was saying. He knew exactly what he was claiming or who he was claiming to be. He was claiming to be God. How do we know that? Because the next verse, they take out, they, they pick up stones just ready to kill him. Because he has made a claim to be God. John 18 is the next one I want us to, to go to. John 18, verse 4 through 6. This is Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane. And... I get wowed by by this one. Verse 4 through 6. He's about to be arrested. Then Jesus, knowing all that would happen to him, came forward and said to them, Whom do you seek? They answered, they answered him, Jesus of Nazareth. Jesus said to them, I am he. Judas, who betrayed him, was standing with them. When Jesus said to them, I am he, they drew back and fell to the ground. That word he is actually inserted by the translators. What he said was this, I am. And the moment he said, I am, they fell to the ground. It shows the authority, it shows the power, it shows the greatness of who Jesus is. You see, Jesus is not simply a person. He's not simply a man. He is fully man, fully God. That's fully one. And as God, he can do what we cannot he is the answer to our inadequacy. You know, we feel inadequate in different times and in different areas of our life, don't we? Maybe you are feeling inadequate to face this new year because you just don't know what's coming. Maybe you feel inadequate because, you know what, it's been a long year and is there ever going to be an end? Maybe you're feeling inadequate because you just don't know if you can bear more challenges. 
maybe you are being called to serve in some way, just to, to, to serve God. And, and you think you don't have the skills and the ability to do it. Maybe there is someone you know that needs to hear about God. And you're thinking and you're worried that you just might not have the right word to say. Maybe you're a parent wondering whether you're doing enough or you have what it takes to raise your child well or even get through the day. We feel inadequate. You know why? Because we are. And that's okay. Because Jesus is the one who is more sufficient to enable us. What is it that we need? What is it that you need? Strength? Courage? Wisdom? Support, joy, peace. What is it that you need? I'll tell you where to find it. Jesus. And just as God told Moses, I am with you. Jesus promises the same thing. Promise your disciples, I am with you. Whatever we face in life, he is with us, enabling us to face the challenge. I'll add to this also a wonderful promise that Jesus said. It starts off kind of negative. It says, troubles you will have. But fear not, for I have overcome the world. In, in Jesus, we have ultimate victory. Yeah, we might, we'll, we'll fail. <laughs> we will, we will mess up. But he has given us ultimate victory. He's given us a relationship with God that never ends. He's given us hope and life of heaven that can never be robbed from us. That's what we need to rely on, God. We need to rely on Jesus, that he is with us. One, one other thing. When you think about it, what is our greatest need? Our greatest need in life is life real life, spiritual life, eternal life. And guess what? Jesus gives that. He has provided and given us life and he sustains that life. So why start here? Why start with the I am of Exodus 3? Because it reminds us of who God is. And that is what truly matters. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for who you are. The great I am. The, the one who is in a category all of his own. The one who is self-existent and not dependent on anyone. The one who meets our inadequacy. Father God, I pray that we turn our eyes upon you. We look full in your wonderful face. We begin to know and be reminded of who you are so that we can have what we need to get through this year. We're so prone to ask the question, who am I? 
but it doesn't matter who we are if we have you. Thank you for your son. Thank you for Jesus. Thank you for the wonderful promise that he is with us. Thank you for the wonderful promise that he is also the I am. God, as we continue to look these next seven weeks, I pray that we will be reminded and encouraged as we turn our attention upon Jesus. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.